So my name is Tel Adam. I'm um, uh, with KDAP. I'm responsible for services uh, there, which means we help people with with cute projects, as most of you probably know. And uh, one big part of that is we help people basically build embedded devices uh, using Qt on a variety of platforms and a variety of uh, hardware and operating systems. And um, that's why I am with, I'm on this stage. Um, I'm privileged to be joined on this stage by Nicolas Moyoncourt, um, who's the founder and CEO of DreamLab, uh, our security partner. Do you want to say a few words about that? Thanks for having us here. Uh, my name is uh, Nick Mayankur. I'm the founder and CEO of DreamLab Technologies, and we actually help people secure their solutions and devices. So um, to set the stage a little bit, um, there's uh, three very broad things that we that we see happening. You've also seen them, I'm sure. We'll go into a little bit of detail, but just to give you an overview, um, there's this thing called the Internet of Things, whatever that means. Who has a clear idea of what the Internet of Things is supposed to be? Yeah, I thought so. Um, there is uh, what they call the mobile age, which is basically the, the idea that mobile devices are everywhere. We all understand that, right? Who doesn't have a smartphone? Thoughts on You don't have one? <laughs> Your boss is very cheap. Um, and the, the commoditization, we'll talk a little bit about what that means um, uh, later on in the presentation. So the, actually, the most important thing probably is this idea that um, pretty much anything out there is now either already connected to the internet or will soon be connected to the internet. And I really do mean everything. Um, you know, there's the famous thermostat, the Nest thing that is, that is online. Um, recently there was, uh, I kid you not, a toothbrush announced. No problem. Connected device, I understand. <laughs> um, so you, did you hear about the toothbrush that has a, a little thingy in it that reports how frequently you brush your teeth up to the cloud? Absolutely necess necessity, that one. Uh, your TV is very likely connected because you need to stream content um, to it. Um, I own a blood pressure monitor because in my job you need one <laughs> uh, that uh, talks to my mobile phone and the mobile phone then sends the data up to the internet, which is really convenient. Um, so your washing machine, if you've been to a recent trade show, you will have seen that they are now also connected to the internet so that they can tell you when they're done uh, washing or whatever they're doing. So. This is a reality. How many of you build devices right now that are not connected to the internet? Okay, how many build stuff that is already connected to the internet? Yeah. And all of you are very likely building devices that will very soon be connected. The other thing is this thing with mobile devices. Um, this whole generation knows nothing else. It's uh, Everybody has a smartphone. Everybody is heavily influenced by the user experiences on those smartphones, which means Touch screens are, are now primary means of interacting with, with technology. Everybody knows it, everybody loves it, or well, whether it makes sense or not is a, is a different thing. But basically, because of this prevalence of mobile devices, everybody expects to get access to everything immediately, all the time, from anywhere, from any device. So it's becoming this ubiquitous access paradigm where uh, you really expect to be able to get to everything from anywhere. And the final thing, we said commoditization, you might as well say pressure. The basic idea is you have to add more and more functionality into these devices. They have to become pretty much kitchen sinks, uh, an infotainment system, you know, a gaming console. It all has to be in whatever device you're building, pretty much. Everything has to be as feature-rich as a mobile device. So that's putting a lot of feature pressure on people making devices. But obviously, there's also a lot of cost pressure because you need to be competitive on the pricing side. So the whole industry, we find at least, at least our customers report that. I don't know how you feel about it, but there, there is a decent amount of pressure on people who make embedded devices to make them bigger, better, more at ever lower price. And the only re way to do that is to use more and more commodity hardware, so pretty much standard boards. How many of you make custom boards for whatever device you're building? A few, and how many use basically off-the-shelf commodity hardware for, for what you're building? It's about half and half. Okay, so we'll see about that. All right, so in summary, we can agree, hopefully, that embedded devices are becoming connected if they're not already connected. They're becoming very, very complex. They are getting to be pretty much mobile phones in terms of the functionality and the interaction. They have touch screens, and they are increasingly built with commodity boards, commodity periphery, commodity operating systems and tools. Okay, with that, I would like to hand it over to Nick. We'll go into a bit of detail about this. Thank you very much for setting the stage, and I can just actually uh, confirm what Till just said. Um, that's actually, it was, well, that's actually uh, reflecting what we see in the field. Uh, we see a changing landscape of embedded devices. Um, 
on the left hand, you see your average old embedded device. On the right hand, you see the now or the future. How we look at these things, um, in the past, we have seen specialized hardware, um, say, in an expensive development process, um, integrated circuits, optimized code, um, updatable only via hardware, uh, no or limited connectivity, and uh, really uh, the special thing for your solution. So that's what happened in the past. Um, more and more today, we see these kind, uh, these beasts. Um, we call it commodity hardware. They look like full-blown computers, like a system on a chip. They are actually cheap. They have a massive interface support. They have massive connectivity, um, wireless, uh, Ethernet, IP, Bluetooth, you name it. And they're getting more and more connected uh, to the internet directly or, or visible from the internet. Um, with this uh, complexity or commoditization, um, the software stack obviously gets more complex as well. So what we see today resembles more a standard uh, computer appliance, um, as I'm just touching here, this laptop. So with this evolution, with this change, uh, what we actually see is that security assumptions uh, need to change or uh, should change, uh, to put it that way. Um, embedded device builders, manufacturers, vendors, um, they had the assumption that their box is so specialized that no one actually knows about it, no one even finds it, and it's actually um, well hidden uh, in another box and well protected from the outside. With this uh, commoditization and uh, connectivity, these assumptions uh, should actually change um, because actually these devices get connected to the internet sooner or later. So why does this uh, matter at all? You could say, you could ask, and you could argue. Um, I am not a target. I'm building a toothbrush. I'm building a washing machine. I'm building a uh, modern iron system. The Internet of Things um, and the commoditization is actually a game changer here. And that's what I would like to share with you. Um, actually, it's the first time ever that, I've, that I am on a uh, developer conference, uh, meeting people that build something. Usually I'm always uh, with people that uh, break something at tech conferences. Um, and I think this, this trend that we're seeing uh, makes it necessary that we should meet up er earlier and more regularly because you guys are building um, what could be our safe future. Anyway, let me explain you, to you why this is a game changer in our perspective. Um, you might rightly say that you are not a target and um, you might be right, but electronic crime is something completely different. They're actually not targeting you, they're targeting your resources, they're targeting your devices, your connectivity, your interconnectivity. They're not actually looking for your washing machine or your customer. They're looking for valuable assets uh, in or around uh, your devices that you build. In the electronic um, crime scene, um, we are talking about sophisticated organizations that actually scan the whole internet on a daily basis uh, just to find new targets, just to find and apply their new exploits, just to get privileges on devices, whatever devices, for later usage. So this is actually the game changer here, and this makes you a target. Or in other words, um, this uh, is your reality. You might have storage, you might have credit card numbers, you might have a Twitter account, you might have any uh, account information. These are valuable targets for modern sophisticated crime. And that's why most probably the software and embedded system you are going to build uh, is on the target list. I'll just give you one uh, funny example. Um, actually, a, a year ago, more or less, this is a uh, iron and 
with embedded uh, uh, solution uh, in it, and it was actually built uh, in China and uh, discovered in Russia um, that these uh, appliances uh, have been um, built with additional features. To put it that way, these additional features um, meant that they were used uh, as spam relays, and they actually what they did is they tried to connect themselves uh, to the Wi-Fi network, and if the Wi-Fi network was protected, they tried to uh, guess the passwords, um, so brute force the passwords, and once they were connected, they were distributing malware. So your, your iron appliance, um, this could be your washing machine, this could be your toothbrush, uh, this could be anything that you guys are going to build. So be aware that uh, you could be a very valuable target. Again, I'm not a target. Are you really not a target? Um, that's basically how these people think uh, of electronic assets, to put it that way. They're just mass scanning um, everything that is available, everything that is reachable. Um, they're trying to infect systems. If they succeed at uh, infecting systems, uh, the first thing that they uh, try to understand is if there is any valuable information. Just to give you some data points on this, uh, a valid, valid credit card number um, on the black market costs around about uh, $10. Um, a full-blown identity depends on the uh, identity between $10 and $500, so it depends on the nation and, and the quality of the identity, etc., etc. Um, service accounts usually go uh, below $10. Um, Service accounts can be anything. It can be actually a, a, a Spotify account, a Twitter account, uh, whatever, um, that uh, is just being sold uh, and reused. Valid email addresses, uh, they tend to be very cheap, uh, but there is lots of them. Um, and uh, intellectual property, I mean, I don't have to tell you what your IPR is worth. Uh, I simply don't know, um, but there could actually be uh, a massive interest in that. So, in case there is no valuable information or it has all been scrapped already and uh, resold, um, the system goes into the next exploitation state uh, where you try to find out if there is any access to any neighboring uh, systems possible. So just to repeat and restart the sequence and just to uh, try to exploit and gain more valuable information. If there is no interconnectedness, if there is no neighboring system, um, the next thing that uh, criminals you look at usually is, is there any network resources that I could be using? Is there any CPU cycles that I could be using? Uh, maybe for Bitcoin mining, maybe for anything else uh, to compute on. Um, and even if not, um, so if everything fails or if everything is already used, uh, the failsafe is actually just use the hardware as a spam relay, as a spam zombie, or one of the thousands and billions of uh, DDoS agents um, that you can actually rent as a service in the internet. So here with I'm, I'm trying to show you the way um, criminals, uh, digital criminals, look at electronic assets, at devices and solutions connected to the internet. And here with I'm trying to um, show you why whatever you build that is going to be connected to the internet, uh, you should actually really properly secure and harden um, the solution you're going to put to your customers. So I'm getting back to the commoditization. Um, another thing um, for the attackability, um, by this evolution of the hardware platforms, we also see an evolution of the attack uh, instruments. Um, by getting more and more commodity, um, more and more standard IT security tools can be used to attack uh, what has been used to be a specialized embedded device. Um, so whatever you find on the internet as standard uh, hacker tools uh, might already apply on modern embedded systems. And what used to be um, highly expensive and highly specialized in terms of uh, bus systems or interconnections 
um, cheap tools exist today uh, to analyze them, logic analyzers, um, oscilloscopes, microscopes, um, these devices uh, became very, very cheap and available. So it's not that you need a super expensive lab to actually analyze such a device. Uh, a couple of hundred dollars is sufficient to do that. So we look at this past where we have the different um, industries or devices um, that have all been specialized platforms and with specialized platforms you needed specialized skills and instruments to actually attack them and we look at this evolution uh, this way and what we see is with the commoditization we have one platform um, serving all the industries which means for a, for a attacker or a criminal that he actually only needs one exploit um, to attack them all um, one exploit to write to fit them all, be it in finance, automotive, or any industry uh, around. And one interjection just for my personal curiosity who here is not using either an IMX, an OMAP5, a Tegra of some sorts, or a Vetra? Who? I rest my case. Okay. <laughs> Three. Three. Okay. Sorry, I exaggerated. <laughs> <laughs> Good. The other thing that makes um, obviously attacks more likely is uh, the connectivity. Um, yesterday, uh, devices uh, tend to be a uh, special purpose. So you had a mobile phone, um, which actually just uh, uh, has spoken GSM. And it was good at that, and it did just that. Um, today, um, with the hardware platforms, uh, you get everything. Uh, you get all different interfaces and connectivity that you could even dream of um, more than you ever need. And so this leads to a better, let's call it accessibility for an attacker. Um, your devices can be accessed uh, via different channels. We see the very same evolution on the software and hardware stacks. So again, on the very left, um, the past, where you have a microcontroller with a custom firmware. In the middle, you already go to a um, system on a chip type, um, potentially with a operating system, potentially, not necessary, um, and your custom software. And today, with the commodity platforms, um, where we just learned that a lot of you are using them, um, the stack gets more complicated. You have a system on a chip, a board with all the connectivity. You have drivers, you have a operating system, um, you have services, demons running on them. You have uh, those uh, BSPs uh, that you get or make yourself, um, maybe, hopefully. Uh, you have your custom software, your apps that you actually develop uh, to put them um, on your embedded device. Even more, speaking about the connectivity, um, again, on the left side, maybe you have connectivity, maybe you're attached to a local specialized network or bus, a, a CAN bus or a ARCnet or a Profi bus or something like, um, maybe, if necessary. Um, in the middle, it's already like changing. Uh, maybe you are connected, uh, maybe not. Maybe you are already connected to the internet. And uh, at last, uh, the newest uh, blend uh, of devices, you definitely are connected to the internet. Um, so, the other thing that adds complexity to the stack that you should need, uh, that you, you'd need to manage, uh, is that most of these layers are actually delivered from different manufacturers, um, different vendors, different components um, that are just uh, assembled together uh, in your stack for your solution. <coughs> and ultimately, if we talk about uh, security, I mean, security is about control, Security is about knowing what you do. Security is about assuring um, what you promise. Um, this just means that you have 
more homework. You need to control all of this if you actually want to provide a secure solution, um, because any breakage, um, no matter on what level, uh, is sufficient to abuse your platform. So in other words, um, this means life for, uh, for, for the security industry has just become more complex. And um, honestly, um, I'm a little bit scared of, of the future. And that's also why I'm here on the stage talking to you about this. Um, honestly, I, I fear buying a new car uh, because of this. Just, uh, so I'm, I'm really speaking to you here. Please uh, assure that this is secure. <clears throat> so, what we did, um, we, we looked at uh, the tools uh, that we find on the internet and uh, we took one of these uh, board uh, support packages um, just, just for fun, just for understanding uh, what this is about. And uh, we found a lot of, of plenty and nice uh, features. And um, just two disclaimers uh, before that. Uh, TI uh, uh, clearly states that uh, this stuff is not meant for production, that this is not fit for production, and that this should never ever be used in production. Yeah, maybe we should briefly explain what it is. So when you <laughs> when you don't when you get a BSP and the board, you put the BSP on there. It comes with some operating system just so you see that it actually works, which makes of course a lot of sense. There is this little launcher thing, which has no other purpose than to launch some demos. So you can validate that your board is working. You got the graphics up. The OpenGL is working. There's network connectivity. The board is fine. So this is a demo launcher. It's a very innocent uh, piece of software, and of course, it was never meant to actually be the basis of any product. Yes, thank you. And of course, as this is only a demo, and it's meant to show how easy things are working and to show off every feature, um, no one has ever uh, thought about security, and, and therefore you get uh, quite a insecure demo um, package, obviously. So, uh, what you see is not what you get. Uh, it's not always what you get. Uh, we've actually really seen in security tests uh, of devices uh, something pretty similar to this. On the left side, you have your special uh, embedded uh, device that is just serving uh, your use case. But it, if you look uh, under the hood, uh, you actually see that it's not really uh, what you get. And this is just to illustrate uh, that we find a lot of things on devices that uh, no one should ever find there, and it should never be there. Um, practically, what we see in our security tests, uh, or what we've seen is like, leftovers, um, firmware images, uh, bash histories, uh, typos, uh, internal staging servers, log files, uh, uh, security keys, access keys, um, unneeded services, uh, leftovers from the BSPs, so uh, still the vulnerable demo software that is uh, shipped uh, as a demo um, by the board manufacturers they are just simply not removed uh, prior to be putting the thing to production. And uh, this leads to severe um, security issues. Um, what we also see typically is uh, so-called deleted files. Uh, please bear in mind, if you delete a file, uh, it's still there. Uh, you can still read it. It's just uh, unlinked. Um, you can still access it. Uh, Maybe that's something we should slightly elaborate. Usually the way that you get data for a board, for an embedded board, is by way of a file system image. It tends to go onto a flash drive, so it probably came from a flash drive, meaning if you have the image, including all of the delete history of the stuff that was previously done on the flash drive, you can pretty trivially undelete that and have pretty much everything that was ever done to that file system. Um, if you know what I'm talking about, I encourage you to try that with a random uh, image that you get for a random board. and. Uh, see what you find. Yes. Well, thank you. Um, uh, we did that. We, we've been shocked um, yes. by our findings. Um, yeah. But the funniest thing is that, of course, the last thing is always somebody trying to clean up. So it's funny if you look at the history and you can clearly see what happened and somebody's, you know, copying together stuff and trying to make the drivers work and downloading a new version of something from somewhere. And you can just read the, the bash history of how the person was assembling the BSP 
because they was just doing it on some board and then when they're done, they copy it off and they use that as the gold master image. The last thing they do is clean up, which is basically just delete whatever they could think of. And they often forget to delete stuff, but even if they do, that's you know, basically doesn't make any difference. So the takeaways here, but what we see usually is a, a lot of demo software from the BSPs, obviously, including all security issues. Um, we see a lot of internal knowledge that we should never ever see. So internal to your company, staging servers, um, security keys. We see deleted files. Well, sometimes we see license violations. I just wanted to, to put that. and. Um, all these findings are not even yet part of a security audit. This is just looking at the object you should analyze and you should audit. So here we are not yet talking about any security tests, any hacking, any breaking of anything, just really, really the basics, just looking at what you get and thoroughly looking at what you get. And you already see all of these, um, which is not the way it's meant to be and uh, which could be a huge uh, risk to your customer or your company. So if we get back and we see the evolution that the modern embedded uh, systems uh, tend to be uh, full-blown computer appliances, uh, why not take the comparison to a uh, modern computer? Um, if we look out of a software protection, uh, IT security perspective uh, on a desktop, on a workstation, um, there is quite a lot uh, of lessons learned in the past decade uh, in terms of IT security. Um, obviously, I mean, it's a, it's a daily topic. Uh, everyone gets attacked, everyone tries to protect himself. So modern operating systems, uh, modern uh, workstations tend to come with a lot of security features. So there are security protections um, against the existence of exploits. So there is a secure coding, safe programming, input validation, output validation, process validation, static and dynamic code analysis. There is protection against exploitation, um, address-based layout transmission, um, non-executable stacks, etc., etc. There is a lot of lessons learned that the consumer devices uh, have gone through, uh, the, the IT world has gone through, um, where I or we today just put a, a big question mark uh, in the embedded market. Um, we don't know the state of uh, the modern embedded systems and we fear that uh, all these lessons learned uh, might not yet be uh, there uh, in the modern embedded market. And, this is just uh, to give you uh, the takeaway that you, you should think about how do we solve that? How do we solve that in a system on a chip, in a modern embedded device? Um, how we protect ourselves against exploits and expo against exploitation? How we prevent exploits and how do we actually maintain our software? How can we ship securely? Uh, daily updates in case we made a mistake because the device probably is connected to the internet and it deserves such an update in case you have a security flaw or a security issue. So I'm not, I'm not aware if these topics are all yet solved in your industry. Um, the only thing that I see in our short security analysis that we sometimes do on devices that uh, we have not yet seen a valid answer against uh, these attacks. And I think it's, it's uh, time to ask these questions to a developer community. If I may add to that, um, actually quite a few of these things do exist on the chips, on the boards. Uh, we very rarely see them enabled in practice. So where does this all lead to? Um, if these features are actually there but not enabled, um, usually you can you can draw up uh, an exploitation uh, scheme or a hunting scheme. Um, so 
there is different ways uh, of, of attacking a, a topic. Uh, you can start wherever you want in that circle. Uh, you can look at the target and understand uh, what device is built uh, in that washing machine, or you can go the other way around and just download a a board or get the devil board and, and look, uh, yeah, what, what kind of these boards, uh, how many you find in the internet. Um, you can use actually uh, the search engines uh, for that. You can use your own port scanners for that. Uh, and then you can um, exploit the target. And that's actually what we did. And we just want to show you how easy um, this is. Uh, we just actually, just for a simple example, uh, we invested uh, uh, one day, one day, um, well, not even one day, I guess. Um, yeah, one day, say one day. So we just bought this one uh, starter kit. Um, just randomly, don't really know, no, uh, no driver there, just randomly a yeah, the, cheap starter kit uh, that was not actually lying around. Uh, <laughs> the fact that this is a TI product and Freescale is a sponsor has nothing to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we looked at this and uh, we made a uh, little fingerprint or we extracted some information. So we understood, okay, it comes with an open embedded uh, uh, system, there is a BusyBox Linux kernel 3.1, there is uh, different services, Telnet, SSHD, Lighty, etc. Um, there is a, a root user with a default, with a great default password. Uh, and of course, there is the, um, this, uh, this, this, this launching matrix GUI uh, feature showcase of the vendor, um, just to show, hey, the device is working, that's what you bought. Um, so we just looked at this uh, and we made kind of a fingerprint of this, just to understand uh, what this is. And then we just searched the internet for similar devices. Um, so actually that's uh, what you would get if you would port scan this in your network. And we just port scanned a little bit farther. We just uh, seeked the internet uh, for this and we just uh, looked for similar devices to put it that way. And uh, we found some matches, um, as you could guess. Um, yes. Yes, tens of thousands, actually. <laughs> yes, and uh, we just picked one random match uh, out of these, uh, just to see if if our assumption uh, can be validated that this is an embedded device and that this is uh, attackable and that this is not really properly secured. And we found out this is the case. Um, so what we found is some um, configuration web GUI uh, for an embedded solution. Um, interestingly enough, uh, within that configuration GUI, we could see it is actually uh, dual home, uh, dual attached. So there is an internet lag and there is an intranet lag. So it's actually a gateway. So it's actually a, a, an open door to a corporate network in an embedded device. So that's why there is uh, two uh, red uh, arrows. Uh, and we just entered with our password uh, on the internet um, on this embedded device. And we've seen um, that this leads to a corporate LAN, uh, which, which we find, I mean, it's kind of a risky situation. So we just landed on this embedded device and um, we actually had no, no clue where we landed. Is this a washing machine? Is this a, a ironing machine? Is this a, uh, a car, uh, what is this? Uh, so we tried to, to tackle that and uh, we found out what it is. Um, uh, we found where it is, uh, we found what it does uh, and everything and we could uh, use that. And I'm not going more into detail about this. Um, I, I'm just trying to make the case here that there are thousands, uh, hundreds of thousands literally uh, of such devices in the internet that are not protected and I just want would like to ask you to not repeat those mistakes uh, because this leads to um, possibly shocking uh, results. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, the functionality of the device is so simple. I mean, it's really trivial that whoever built that with complete certainty was saying nobody is going to ever want to attack this because it does nothing. Yeah. Which is true. And unfortunately, really untrue for electronic crime. Again, um, if any scanner just finds this, uh, he will be using uh, and abusing uh, this machine, uh, this device. 
Um, another case that has been publicly uh, disclosed, uh, not from us, uh, we just found this, uh, which is obviously a good driver when you buy a device uh, for $800 and you can simply update it or upgrade it uh, with a software mechanism um, to a device which uh, is worth $1,600. Um, so this means this uh, oscilloscope um, by design, by hardware, um, can make both, and actually the upgrade is just a license key. So this is actually a good motivation for a hacker to just get his his upgrade for free. And um, that's what's going to happen if you ship uh, full-blown um, solutions with software limitations. Which you do because of the commoditization, because increasingly people build one system and then they have software feature unlock, because it is much, much cheaper to have one platform and then differentiate in software rather than buying different or building different uh, variants of the of the device that actually have physically different feature sets because you're trying to you know have as much in common as you possibly can to get the cost down okay. so we already tackled this uh, how to mitigate this on a hardware level um, use the security features that you've been delivered uh, really use them. Um, most of the embedded uh, vendors actually do deliver a lot of features that should and can be used. Please uh, assure that you really use them in your production. Uh, on the software layer, um, low and control your software stack. Um, I've shown you a little landscape. Uh, try to really control each and all elements of it uh, in order to assure that you're really delivering um, <coughs> something secure. Um, apply a software version control, um, apply release management, uh, and make a production software uh, Q&A. So make clean builds, uh, just not to, to repeat the mistake of leftover data, um, not stripping data, but make a clean build from scratch. Strip all debug symbols, etc., etc. So I would okay. like to Hand over yes. to Mr. Cute. <laughs> Since this is a Cute conference, we thought we would be amiss if we didn't give you some Cute perspective on this. Um, to be clear, Cute doesn't fix this at all. I, in fact, I talked to Lars yesterday, and he agrees that this is something that we, as a Cute community, should probably start tackling on a variety of fronts. We haven't really. I mean, we're pretty secure, I guess, on the desktop to the extent possible, and on mobile where it's used in mobile. But an embedded Cute, as such, doesn't really provide a solution for this problem. It does help in a few ways. It, uh, I'd like to go through those now. So Qt, if you look at it as a vendor, as something that is part of that stack that Nick described, it actually does a reasonably good job of being mature and, and well monitored. There's lots of eyes on this code. Uh, some of you are developing on Qt. I can see a few familiar faces back there and everybody keeps an eye out for it. Um, companies like, like DreamLab, um, have started taking an interest in looking at that because uh, they want this stuff to be secure as well. Um, we have made many, many, many mistakes over the last 10 years already, and they have been corrected. If you talk to David, who did the temporary file stuff, for example, uh, he can tell you uh, many, many interesting stories of all the bugs in there um, that he had to fix, and David is probably one of the best Qt programmers in the world. So we have already made those mistakes. Nobody needs to make them again. That's good. Um, we have pretty good integration overall, so we, we don't have so many interfaces to external libraries, it's all pretty cohesive, so that makes for a, a relatively well-controlled system. And collective maintenance of sensitive code tends to be safer because at least you kind of average out the mistakes between a bunch of smart people rather than just one smart person. So we do find each other's mistakes as a community and, and Qt does that internally as well as a, as a culture within the Qt company. So that's good and you know we do have a pretty decent track, track record when it comes to reacting to security issues like Heartbleed, I think, you know, Qt was patched and released within something like 48 hours when that happened. So we're not that bad on that front, I'd say. Um, as a community, I mean, this is not just Qt as something you buy or you, you get in an LGPL version, but as us who all work with and on Qt, um, we are all um, keen on this topic, at least those of us with a, a strong kind of background in freedom, let's say, the open source and free software, those of us tend to have a an interest in security topics. So there are a few people who really, really um, dig into Qt as a hobby, I guess, and, and they do find uh, interesting problems pretty regularly. They report them pretty reliably and responsibly so that we as a community can react 
And because it's all out there and open, it's pretty easy to report a security issue against Qt. It's definitely much easier than reporting a security issue against any of your devices, I would imagine. You know, I don't want to um, speak badly of any of you, but I'm pretty sure it's easier to report a bug to Qt than to your organization, whatever that organization may be. And you actually have help available. There's a pretty good community out there with knowledgeable people that you can ask, is this good practice? Is this a stupid idea? You know, could you look at this and see if I'm doing the right thing? And Qt can be kind of a role model as a, as a process. There are some things we get right in Qt, I feel. Um, we, we have things like an institutionalized review process. Anything that goes into Qt is reviewed. There is an explicit approval process. There is definitely somebody who has said, I have read this, I have looked at this, and this is cool to go in. Even if they are not a security expert in themselves, just the fact that somebody explicitly looks at everything that goes into the code base, that definitely helps, uh, particularly if those people have a sensibility for security issues so that they, if they see something, will point it out to the author. So hopefully not terribly much can sneak in uh, under those watchful eyes. There is a culture of security consciousness, so pretty much anybody who works on Qt knows that it's not a good idea to be insecure and everybody tries to uphold that standard. Um, you, you have to tell me if that the same is true within your organization or how many people actually truly care about making a secure product. My experience with consulting for people is that there's usually a few people who really care very deeply and the vast majority of people couldn't care less. Yes. Yeah. So we do have pretty good architecture, stuff is encapsulated, things do one thing, they, they have clean interfaces, it's pretty much a well-designed system and obviously that helps because if it's well-designed it's harder to attack just on basic principle. There is a pretty strict release process. There's a really good audit trail. We do not ship stuff that we don't know, that we're not, you know, sure is good. Uh, that we are definitely sure what is in the tarballs. We have all the processes in place that it's really hard to sneak something into Qt. It has been tried. It has been successfully done with Linux, with the Linux kernel. So it's not like this doesn't happen. So, you know, again, it's a good, good practice to, to make sure that you are actually in control of that part of the delivery as well. And you can learn from Qt. There's some good tools out there. There's some good best practice to look at. This is a little bit harder. Um, Qt actually has a really good security team. There's a bunch of people who, uh, who are in that team who share the responsibility, both um, uh, professionals that are employed to do that, but also volunteers who do that, because they feel strongly that this should be done. Um, if you can, and I know this is not easy, if you can get your organization to have a professional, responsive, reachable security team that will address those issues when they come in, because the vast majority of issues are found, they're reported in a friendly, professional, full disclosure manner and then ignored, because the organization is not set up to deal with them when they come in. Not because they're evil or you know malicious or anything, just because nobody has that on their radar that they need to have this in their process to make sure that they actually do this. How many of you would say that you have this in place? One. Awesome. I want to know who you work for later on. <laughs> no, actually, I think I know who you work for. <laughs> okay. All right. So some best practice things. Just uh, I asked David um, and others, what should I definitely say in this presentation to take, for people to take home? Please don't bypass Qt. We see that way too often. People have their own strings. They have their own sockets. They do their own XML parsing. Even if you don't want any of the features of QString, you do want the security of QString. It has 15 years of really good security practice in it. I can guarantee you, your string is not as secure as QString. The same is true for sockets. The same is true for the XML passing code. Constant stream of security issues in that one for many, many years. If we have them in our code, I'm sure you have them in your code too. So, you know, at least don't get the bugs that we've already fixed. Temporary files, byte arrays, database access, all of that stuff is sensitive. So stay away from doing that yourself, except as Nick has, um, has hopefully made it clear that you can be attacked and you will be attacked no matter how trivial your, your device, no matter how uninteresting your data. Just accept it and put it into your process. Do systematic threat modeling. So try and make the, the architecture default uh, secure from the beginning. Make security an integral part of your development process if you can. Analyze the finished product when you're done analyze the operational context of when it will be deployed and how it will be deployed. And if you can't do that yourself, turn to people who can. That's what we do. That's why we work with Streamlab. And most definitely do not trust the vendor, no matter how big, just because 
Freescale or TI or any of the other ones, NVIDIA or Intel made it, does not mean it is secure. You can take my word for it. So, some other things that we can do more generally, less is more, don't use stuff you don't need, don't enable stuff you don't need, remove stuff you don't need, remove all debug interfaces, physical and software. There's a bunch of you know physical access ways to your board that you might just want to dis disable. Reduce the complexity wherever you can, because that just will make you more secure. Review what you have built, because somebody else will look at what you've built, so you better do it yourself first. Do you have incentives to, to help, you know, incentivize people to report whatever issues you will have, because you will have issues to you so you can deal with them promptly, responsibly, and so on. And take customers' data seriously, because as Nick pointed out, one of the key drivers of this um, criminal economy is people's personal data. And the harder you make it to get to that, the less of an industry this can continue to be. Okay, thank you very much. Do you have any questions so far? Do we have time for questions? All right, awesome. Please. Mm -hmm. um, do you, do you um, uh, know uh, there there are lots of um, there's lots of stuff available for C plus plus from the standard library? Yeah. Do you absolutely. have? Uh, uh, can you say anything about the security or, or the, the the value of the standard library from a security point of view? Um, first of all, there are various implementations of the of the STL. Um, so depending on your platform, you'll get a different one. And they don't all have the same security standard. And particularly embedded, you see some really old STL implementations around. So you have to kind of differentiate between STL, the concept, the API, and the architecture, and STL, the implementations. The STL as an architecture and as a concept is reasonably secure. There isn't any particular thing in there to make it particularly secure, but it's also not insecure in any fundamental way. Several of the implementations, particularly older ones, are not great when it comes to security. So I wouldn't say you know using standard string is any worse than using QString. At least you're using something that many other people use. So very likely it's better than having your own. Right? So I wouldn't say you know the cute ones are better than any particular STL implementation. Using one that is widely used and that is current and updated and is responsibly managed, that's really what it's about. Whether it's Qt or Boost or any of the other kind of you know, well mainstream, well maintained, um, shared bits of infrastructure. Uh, yeah, Jens. Sorry, I'll get to you in a sec. No, look, let's do Jens first. Now, we've seen this year two major bugs, at least with Shadshock and uh, Heartbeat. How do you manage to update your boards if there is anything shipping which we shouldn't? have on that in the future? That is actually a really tricky question. So the whole question of how do you update embedded devices in general? Uh, because security updates are just one part of the problem. It's mostly the driver, what makes people want to do updates. But the thing with updates is you need infrastructure on the device, of course, and that needs to be built into the development process. But you also need infrastructure on the server side, and you need infrastructure to maintain the things that you then push out to the devices. So there is a big complex services component to this on, on usually on the web or some maybe sometimes over USB or whatever interface you use for updating. And there aren't any cohesive solutions yet for making that easy. Several people are working on that. So I know that the Qt company is working on something like that as part of Qt for device creation. There are other vendors who are building similar systems, um, mostly coming in from the cloud side, shall we say. So the big ones, IBM and such, they're, they're working on these kinds of things. Um, Arm has just, uh, they have launched something called embed.org, which tries to address some of that. So the industry is large, at large, I think, is aware of the problem. There isn't a standard solution yet. Everybody does their own thing. Uh, on depends on the OS as well. On Linux, people tend to throw together some packages with a package manager and then have some sort of an update server somewhere. It's a pretty primitive way of doing it. On Windows CE, people tend to hope nothing bad happens. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, on, on QNX, for example, they are building a cloud infrastructure that you can connect to that will do that kind of secure updating and provisioning, which they've taken over from, from the BlackBerry side. So it depends on your OS. It depends on the stack that you're using overall. There are vendors emerging that try to solve the, the cloud side of this, but definitely nothing standard yet. And most people make their own at this point, which is, of course, not ideal. 
Um, sorry, you first. <laughs> uh, say we're I'm building a device for a customer, and a customer says that the device is going to be installed in a or closed office, and uh, you're going to be on a secret network. And I do not need to care as a software developer for the security issues inside, inside in the device because it's going to be like locked up. Mm -hmm. uh, how seriously do I take it? And uh, what reasons do I bring to the customer to you know, to invest into device security anyway, software security? Do you want to take that maybe? Did you get the question? Well, I mean, can, can your customer really actually uh, guarantee that this device will never be attacked by its neighbors? Um, I, I guess that not, or he should at least start with that thought. Um, can he guarantee for the next years to come that there will be no aggressor in the neighboring networks? Um, that's the key question to ask. Uh, I mean, if your customer is just blind towards security issues, you cannot do anything about it, but you might just share these thoughts with him and, and make him change his opinion about this. Mm. So in our experience, I mean, we've uh, also, we have limited experience with trying to convince people to invest in this and uh, with mixed success, I have to say, because largely the, the approach that people have is, well, I'm not interesting, I'm not connected, it's not going to be my problem. By the time this is a problem, I'll not be in this company anymore. <laughs> so it's, it is a problem, but two things work really well. One is the, even if you're not connected, your neighbor in the internal network might be. So, you know, you might not be the access gateway, but you might still be attacked. And the other thing is, if you have a CPU, if you have RAM, if you have disk, if you have bandwidth, you are a target, period. Those two things tend to make people go, hmm, <laughs> not always, but sometimes. Tani, um, asking about um, experience in that area. Um, how do customers react to um, suggestions about automated updates? You said they are mostly not very interested, but when they are, uh, do they raise concerns concerning the, um, um, the fact that you usually want a silent update probably because embedded devices are nothing that have pop-ups with do you really want to update? Yeah. Or maybe they do. Um, that would be one question. The other is, um, do you generally advise them to have silent updates? Well, to be honest, we advise them to have updates in the first place and not even that gets through. Okay. Um, we always, very early on in every embedded project, say, please consider how you will update this because you will need to update this. And they always say, yeah, but we'll do that after all the features are done. And then <laughs> one week before it needs to be shipped, somebody realizes, oh, we have no idea how to update this. So then, you know, wild hackery ensues and some sort of thing is getting cobbled together and then hopefully tested and then shipped with the test server enabled. Very recent example just happened. Somebody shipped the device with the test server enabled. And let notice afterwards had to recall, reflash with the actual production update server and then, you know, not pleasant. But we're still in that phase where we're actually getting to people to realize that they need to update in the first place, let alone think about what is the process of giving people control over the updates, because this is a much more complicated thing. You know, sometimes you want to give the people who control the endpoint the ability to say, I want to update now, or I want to update this weekend when I have a downtime for other reasons in my network. I might want to get every security update immediately without human intervention. Maybe this thing is on an oil rig or it's at the top of a, of a lightning antenna. You know, you might not be able to physically get to it. Um, so you, you might need various levels of control and decision making by different people in the process that needs to be designed. It's complex. It's not something that your average embedded engineer is going to worry about when they're taking nine make six and putting a UI on top to make something that has a touch screen. It just doesn't happen. Yeah, Kelly. Um, I'm a bit afraid that if you gave this presentation to the CTO of a company making consumer gadgets, their answer would be, well, we're making 20 euro gadgets. Our profit per unit is five cents. If we followed all this advice that you have given us, then this would reduce our profit to zero or a negative number. So why should we be doing this? And that makes me wonder if anything will even change, in particular in the area of consumer gadgets, if there is no damage trail, for example, if I cannot prove that what led to my bank account being cleared, my credit cards being fraudulously charged was actually the wireless mouse that I connected to my computer and that was insecure. Unless that can be proven and it's made public, I don't think a lot of, thing, a lot of, a lot of change is going to happen. 
Um, Do you want to comment? Unfortunately, you are right. Um, unfortunately, we've seen this uh, for over, uh, well, for decades, uh, that uh, people just uh, tend to only react uh, when you show them the facts in the press. Um, I was hoping by talking to developers um, that uh, the, this might change um, because uh, we've we've seen that uh, corporations tend to hide these things and they really need to force. Uh, um, that they they change and um, what can I say? What we see with the commoditization um, that more and more important uh, devices uh, rely on these technologies like uh, your car um, or things, things like that. So I I hope that this will change by the liability. On the other hand, um, if you look at the ironing kit, um, which is just sending spams and distributing malware. Um, this has been discovered and I guess that the Chinese manufacturer will not try this again because uh, this was a costly exercise and, and I hope this will change over the decades to come. And I think it's partially a critical mass problem as long as we live in a world where everything is unsecure by default and nobody on the trail has any risk because everybody is just as bad, there is no accountability. If we go out and build largely secure devices and then the odd one that is really insecure along the way can be singled out because we have good documentation and audit trail that everything else was not the problem, then maybe there's enough pressure on those remaining few to get their act together. Then again, that might be wishful thinking. Daniel? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, my, yeah, my question is maybe a little bit in the same direction. <laughs> uh, I was wondering, uh, working for automotive uh, sector, we had to deal with uh, functional safety levels, with regulations. We had to prove uh, that we uh, uh, coded several things in a specific way and that we ensured uh, safety. So is there anything in discussion uh, on the governmental level or something like that uh, to have similar regulations that uh, companies who want to produce uh, such customer edge uh, devices have to uh, prove certain security levels or whatever? Not to my knowledge. Um, I'll, get, I'll answer in a second. One aspect for automotive, yes, automotive has all of these controls in place, for example, but then they don't apply to the IVI system, right? In the IVI system, you can happily play MP3 files without all that regulatory burden, which is why they make it a separate system. Now. Emerging cars want to have that all in one system because it's nice to see your MP3 playing in the you know, between in your instrument cluster between your your dials. So these systems are merging together, and then of course the pressure on the, the tightly controlled system from the not so tightly controlled system that has all the nice features that people buy cars for is increasing. So this is kind of being undermined a little bit, even in automotive, because in the end people want to connect their iPhone, and if it doesn't connect the iPhone, they're not going to buy the car. So, and this, this, all of the safety stuff is, is to some extent secondary to that. Yeah, the brake system is secure, but the MP3 player certainly isn't, even in the car. So there's still some gray area there, but I'm not aware of any industry, cross industry efforts to raise the standard. Maybe yes, in medical, of course, in highly regulated industries, you see some of that, but not broadly, I think. I disagree a little bit. I'm okay, very go ahead. Sorry no, about that. I mean, I'm not the expert. So. <laughs> no, I, I agree that uh, there there is no no serious uh, regulation for security, uh, and there is no efforts, no serious efforts. Uh, what there is, and you're uh, right about that, there is uh, safety uh, regulations, but safety is not the same as security. Um, and I, uh, I I just have to uh, outline this. Um, Security means exploiting a uh, software or a solution, which is a, a different uh, task than, than a safety protection. So for security, the only thing that you tend to get is um, assurance levels. Um, assurance levels uh, describing uh, or assuring that the software you built uh, complies with the specification uh, you did. Um, but again, this is an assurance level. This is no security feature. Uh, and the, the shocking truth or, or the truth that we see as of today is that the standard security features or protections that you would wish for, um, they are virtually non-existent. Um, and uh, on top of this, we see no efforts on a governmental or regulatory level to attack this problem at all. And what Till rightly outlined is 
um, <sighs> with the connectedness, um, it's just getting worse because yeah, the IVI now has an interface to the safer environment. Okay, I think that's all the time we had. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Adam and Mr. Marinko. Thanks for coming us.